Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Monica McDougall here. Today, I am bringing you a sermon titled, I Want to Know What Love Is, which is inspired by 1 Corinthians 13. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the churches at Corinth. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge. And if I have a faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. For love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it too will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection, as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Throughout this past month, I've been thinking a lot about love. The month of June is Pride Month, a month set aside every year for LGBTQ plus persons to celebrate their identities, families, history, and contributions to our society. As many of you know, LGBTQ plus persons often have painful relationships with the church. A handful of scriptures are used by some Christians to justify the exclusion, mistreatment, and discrimination of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and or queer individuals. During Pride Month every year, I find myself thinking a lot about the disconnect between people who claim to be so committed to loving people and the ways those same people actually treat people who look, love, and live differently than they do. I've personally never encountered a Christian who didn't claim to value love. I mean, it is an important foundational element of our faith. Love is a word we hear a lot in the church. It's a word that is mentioned hundreds of times in our Bible. The exact number varies from translation to translation, but in the common English Bibles that we use at Trinity, the word love is written nearly 700 times. Some of the most famous passages of scripture are ones that are written about love. Undoubtedly, the scripture passage from 1 Corinthians this morning is one that you are very familiar with. You've probably heard those famous words, love is patient, love is kind, dot, 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 at most of the weddings you've attended. And you've probably heard those words on almost every TV and movie wedding you've ever seen. It's a passage of scripture that is so famous that it's almost a cliche. Love in scripture is described as both the greatest commandment and the greatest gift given to us by God. So how does love get so messy among Christians? I've come to the conclusion that while all Christians, at least the ones whom I have encountered, believe that love is important and crucial to the Christian faith, our problem lies in the fact that some of us have very different understandings and definitions of what it means to love. I thought about this a lot while I was preparing for the sermon, and it sent me on a quest to figure out how scripture defines love, how scripture informs us about what the definition of loving our neighbor truly is. And that's how I ended up at 1 Corinthians. 
I understand that it may seem like an odd place to start. The writings of the Apostle Paul are controversial to say the very least. Paul's writings are often cited by Christians as justifications for discriminating against women, people of color, LGBTQ plus persons, the poor, etc. For many of those people who have been harmed by these interpretations of Paul's letters and their allies, the impulse is to reject Paul altogether. However, I don't think that's particularly fair or effective. Because whether we like it or not, Paul's letters, those that we know he actually wrote and those that were likely claimed to be written by him but weren't, those letters are in our Bible. Therefore, they have at least some amount of influence over Christians. And I don't think the solution to unethical or harmful interpretations of Paul's writings is to throw them out altogether. But I also don't think that we should accept them at face value without critical thinking and questions. I think the solution rather is to study them deeper, more intently, to try to understand Paul's context and to remember, most importantly, Paul's humanity. Paul was not a divine being. He was fully human, period. Like you and me, he had blood flowing through his veins. He had oxygen flowing through his lungs. He was made of flesh and bone. Only one person was all of that and also fully divine, and that person was Jesus Christ. But Paul, Paul was just a person. Because of this, Paul was imperfect. He was capable of sin, of harm, of being wrong. Just like we too are capable of using his words today to sin, to cause harm, and to be wrong. To deny this, to claim that Paul's words are infallible, is to deny Paul his humanity, his ability to make mistakes, to screw up, to be imperfect. It turns him and his words into idols. This isn't fair to him, his memory, or to the people we interact with using his scriptures thousands of years later. However, it also isn't fair to reject him and his wisdom altogether. There is a lot of beauty and wisdom and meaning in Paul's letters, and we know through scripture that God uses so many imperfect people to make the world better and different. Paul's writings, much like people, can hold multitudes. We have this famous passage from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians about love that is so inspiring and beautiful and moving that we incorporate it into our marriage rituals. However, we also have writings attributed to Paul that criticize the leadership of women in the church that can be interpreted to possibly condemn same-sex relationships or even seem indifferent to slavery. When we pluck these verses out of their context, they can become easily wielded to fit a harmful agenda. And they often are used in deeply problematic and harmful ways. This is why it is so crucial that we try and understand where Paul was when he wrote these letters, to understand who he was writing to and what he was writing about. I mean, imagine if someone took only the sent text messages off of your phone and used them to start dictating how other people should live. You would probably think, hold up now, wait a minute, you only have part of the story. With Paul's letters, we only have part of the story, which is why we must do our due diligence to find out as much of the story as we can. And even then, we may not like or agree with what we find, but I think that's okay. To disagree is a normal part of belonging to the diverse body of Christ. In fact, that's actually what Paul is writing about in 1 Corinthians. So with all of that being said, I would like to tell you a little bit more about this letter to the churches at Corinth. I promise I'm going to try to make it as interesting as possible. Now, when we say that this is Paul's first letter to Corinth, we don't mean it's the first time he's ever written them. Rather, it is the first of two letters which survived time and became part of our biblical canon. In fact, Paul wrote many times to Corinth, um, and he wrote to them at least once before sending this specific letter but most of those writings did not survive. We don't know where they're at. Now, Corinth is a fascinating city in the ancient world. The city of Corinth is located in Greece and has been through many variations throughout history. 
In fact, the Corinth that Paul knew is not the original Corinth. The original city of Corinth was destroyed in 146 BCE by the Romans and remained mostly deserted until nearly 100 years later in 44 BCE when Julius Caesar established the new city. Caesar imagined Corinth to become a large cosmopolitan hub that would be crucial to the Roman Empire. It was located on a popular trade route at the time and it held a strategic location for growing the Roman economy. So Caesar repopulated the city using mostly veterans of the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Empire's army, and freed slaves of Greek and Jewish heritage. This made Corinth into a melting pot of different ethnicities, religions, experiences, and culture. This melting pot became exactly what Caesar imagined it to be. It became a large, bustling, cosmopolitan city that drew tourists from all around the Roman Empire seeking out theater, trade, and more. At its height, ancient Corinth had approximately 100,000 people, which made it a massive city in the ancient world. Although ancient Corinth was a large city, the church at Corinth was anything but large. I think sometimes when we picture the apostles going around and visiting the early church, we imagine them speaking in front of crowds of thousands. But the church at Corinth was, uh, was at this time just a handful of small house churches that met mostly in secret. Much like the greater city though, the churches were composed of people from all sorts of different ethnic and religious backgrounds. Unsurprisingly to all of us, that means that there was conflict in Corinth between people who had different experiences and different walks of life. The Roman Empire, however, encouraged this conflict, dividing its citizens based on culture and class. People were encouraged to sacrifice everything to the Roman cult. Their identities, cultures, and religions were expected to be pushed aside in praise of the empire and most importantly, the emperor. However, as members of the church, early Christians were expected to live in devotion to God because in the church, there was no room for division. The body of Christ needed to be strong to ensure survival of the movement. So early Christians found themselves in a very difficult push and pull between the cultural expectations of Rome and the cultural expectations of the church. This push and pull led to tremendous conflict within the church itself. And this is the context behind Paul's letter. In his absence, Paul has received news of the community in Corinth regarding immoral behavior and falling out. Christians in Corinth have begun favoring individuals who exhibit certain spiritual gifts like that of speaking in tongues. And this has led to jealousy and rivalry between members of the congregation. And these, this conflict, this confrontation threatens the unity of the church community in Corinth. It also appears that Paul is writing this letter in part to respond to the congregation who had requested clarification on a number of matters, such as marriage and the consumption of meat previously offered to idols. When I think about this context and all of this conflict, I imagine that the Corinthian Christians were quite confused and scared. I mean, one day Paul shows up, starts their local church, converting them to this new Jesus movement that they didn't know much about. And by converting to this new faith, their lives are irreversibly changed. Um, and it has a huge impact on the way they practice their lives culturally and religiously. And then the next thing they know, this person who started this faith, who led them to this new religion, is off moving to the next community. And now they're on their own with this new fragile family that they've been thrusted into. It's no wonder that tensions are high. This tension is the inspiration for Paul's letter. So this passage about love that has become synonymous in our culture with weddings and romantic love is actually about Christian love generally. Dr. Caroline Lewis of Luther Seminary summarizes this distinction by writing, quote, this text has little to do with the love that is associated with marriage. Rather, it is about unity and difference and how those can only be acknowledged, respected, and celebrated when love is at the center of what we do and who we are as the Christian community. Against all popular opinion, this is not a passage about romantic love, but about a radical communal love that enables individuals to imagine life in a community where unity and difference can coexist. I don't know about you, but I personally think that that's even more beautiful and inspiring than thinking of this passage purely in terms of marital love. 
Paul is making a theological argument that love must be central to the Christian mission and that they shouldn't be scared of one another's differences. Again, I think most Christians today would agree that love should be central to the Christian mission, but where we disagree is in what it means to love one another. A common phrase that Christians who oppose the full inclusion of LGBTQ plus persons um, will say is, quote, love the sin or hate the sin. You've probably heard that or seen it before. And this speaks to those individuals' belief that any sexuality or gender identity that doesn't fit into the small, narrow box of cisgender, meaning not transgender, or heterosexual, meaning not gay, lesbian, bisexual, etc., is inherently sinful. And people get to that belief from a handful of scriptures that they believe criticizes LGBTQ plus identity. Now, we can and have had entire Bible studies where we take those handful of scriptures that people think condemns homosexuality and we put them back into context and we demonstrate that they actually have relatively nothing to do with LGBTQ plus identity as we know it today. And of course, if you're struggling with how to interpret those scripture passages, your pastors would be happy to talk to you. There are great resources out there to help us begin understanding those scriptures better and to deconstruct our thinking on healthy, committed, homosexual, same-sex relationships. But that is not my task today. My task today is to figure out what it means to truly love someone. Because I don't believe that being gay or trans is a sin. Sin is, as I understand it, and at its simplest definition, that which separates us from God. But living into the truth of who God made you to be makes you closer to God and is therefore the opposite of sin. Furthermore, I don't believe that you can claim to love someone and hate a key part of their identity. You can't claim to love me and then hate the family I've created. You can't claim to love someone and hate who they know themselves to be. Love is not merely tolerating someone's existence. Love is not merely not wishing them ill. Love is not merely wanting the bare minimum for them. Love is transformational. Love is active. Love is not a noun or an adjective. Love is a verb. The way we understand 1 Corinthians 13 today is that we see verses 4 through 6, the love is patient, love is kind, um, to be a list of adjectives describing what love is. However, the original Greek text reveals that Paul is not listing what love is, he's listing what love does and what it does not do. Love does practice patience. Love does act kindly. Love does not act with jealousy. Love does not boast. Love does not exist in arrogance. Love does not come with rudeness. Love does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Love does rejoice in the truth. Love does bear all things. Love does believe all things. Love does hope in all things. Love does endure in all things. Love never ends. Each one of those statements comes with an active verb. Now, this distinction between this passage being a list of verbs rather than a list of adjectives may feel like an irrelevant and pedantic argument, but it is important. It is central to Paul's message for he is not describing a love that is a passive feeling that you have for someone, but rather he's describing a love that takes action towards someone. It's the type of love that Jesus exhibited that pushed him into community with the very people whom the greater society he existed in rejected and cast it aside. Jesus did not merely tolerate those whom he came into contact with, he entered into intentional community with them. He saw the invisible, he healed the unsurvivable, he touched the untouchable. As the church at Corinth was on the verge of collapse due to petty disagreements and hierarchical thinking that elevated certain members of the body of Christ higher than others, Paul was essentially saying that the church community becomes no better than the Roman Empire when we lead without love. It is Rome that thrives on division and practices hatred. But in Christ, we thrive on unity, and we are called to practice love. 
To be a member of the body of Christ is to surrender your life into love. Every Sunday at the start of the service, you hear one of your pastors say the following. For those of you who are watching this online, you may not know this, but every Sunday at the start of our service, one of the pastors will say the following. We believe that every person is of value to God and to our faith community. Whatever our race, age, ability, income, sexual orientation, or gender identity, we are all created in the image of God. So why do we say that every week? Why do we start out our service with that every week? Well, because for some people sitting in our pews, that might be the very first time in their entire lives that they have been told that they have value and that they are loved, not in spite of who they are, but because of who they are. And in a world where LGBTQ plus youth are 120% more likely to experience homelessness and four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers, it becomes crucial that we be a church, that we be Christians who are brave enough to truly love LGBTQ plus people, to see their worth and to speak it out loud. The good news for us is that we have all that we need to be able to love one another because God has first loved us and has showed us the way. If we so choose, we can take on that active, tireless, unconditional love and we can use it to make a meaningful difference in our world. But that requires us to take action, to take risks, to speak up and call out injustice. There are forces at work in our church and in our world that are hell-bent on dividing us using fear and hatred to push us away from one another, and we must resist. We must. So how do we do that? Well, we can start by educating ourselves using accurate sources, right? Learning as much as we can about different cultures, identities, ethnicities, religions, so that we're not scared by our differences. And we may never fully understand one another. Just like this motley crew of folks in Corinth who were retired army veterans and, and slaves, freed slaves from Greek and Jewish heritage. They, they, there's no way they would ever possibly fully understand one another's experience and culture. But at the end of the day, we're a family and healthy families make the effort to try. They have the conversations even when they're difficult and they lead with love. In closing today, I want to revisit Paul's words from 1 Corinthians. And as I read this passage once again, I hope you will listen intently. As I describe love and Paul's words, I want you to think about the people in your life whom you've encountered who embody Paul's vision of active, tireless love. How has their love transformed you? How has their love sustained you? When I'm done reading the passage and I close out my sermon, I hope you will take a moment of silence. And in that moment, I ask that you will say a prayer recommitting yourself to the Christian mission of love. And with that, let us once again hear these words from the Apostle Paul. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. For love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. 
Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Amen.